I believe this is life changing what I'm going to share with you today because it changed my life. I've been born again now since 1980. I'm in my 26th year of serving God with my whole heart. And uh, I have seen hundreds of thousands of people come to Christ. I've seen signs, wonders, and miracles, magnificent things of God happen in my life. But in this last few months, I learned something. Thank God he patiently teaches us. And by the way, there are things that you can learn this year that, that you couldn't have learned last year if he'd have told you because you weren't mature enough and didn't have. And that's what I just found out. You have to get the basics before you can get the deeper stuff. Yeah, there are foundational truths in the Word of God. There's a place in the fourth chapter of Mark where Jesus said, unless you understand this parable, then you can't understand any parables. That's what God calls a foundational truth. So we're going to go over a few of those today. But right before I do that, I want to pray with you. So will you please set yourself in agreement with me? Father, I thank you, God, for this holy opportunity. These next few minutes, Father... Uh, the, your precious sons and daughters here, they don't need some boring sermon from some traveling preacher. We need to hear from you, God. This is your word, and we are your children. And Lord, your word can only be revealed by your spirit. So I ask you to open a door of utterance unto me by your Holy Spirit. I ask you to fill my mind and my mouth and my heart with your thoughts that you may be exalted. Lord, it's all about you, Jesus. That's the only reason we're here today. We love you, and we want to love you more. We want to learn to love you the way you love us. And Father, we want you to enjoy us being your children the way we enjoy you being our Father. So help us, God, and we'll be very careful, sir, to give you all the glory and the honor forever. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I want to speak to you for a few minutes this morning about, uh, again, some foundational truths. Let me say this to you. God wants to go home with you after church today. Some people know this is the house of the Lord and they feel his presence when they come in here. And that's good. But I just want to tell you that if you're born again, I want to remind you that when you ask Jesus into your heart, when you, when you acknowledge the fact that God has a son, his name is Jesus, that God raised him from the dead, and you ask him to come and live in your heart, according to the word of God, he did come to live in your heart. Not physically, he didn't step into you, but he came by his spirit. And according to the word of God, you're body is now the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now you need to be aware of that at all times that when we pray and we say amen, God doesn't leave town. Just because we say amen, that doesn't dismiss God. We're talking, he hears every word we say. So when, you're, when you hit yourself on the thumb with the hammer, remember he's listening. He doesn't just listen when you say, dear father, amen. He's with us at all times in every situation. Now, what is real true Christianity about? Christ in you is your hope of glory. And when you become aware that God is in you, he did really come to live in your heart when you invited him in. He's there at all times. He's not just there on Sunday. He's there on Friday night. He's there when the devil attacks. And once we understand who he is and how he does things, we're not ever afraid of the devil attacking anymore because let me tell you something, God doesn't take any stuff off the devil. And, and, and what he wants me and you to do is to learn how to not have to take any stuff off of him either. God wants us to become the champions and the warriors that he has called us to be. Priests and kings of our God is the way he put it. Amen. He will take your sins if that's all you give him. But what he really wants is your life. I'm going to have to say that again. Most Christians give God their problems, not their life. Now, if you're going to get everything God's got and he does want to give it to you, then you're going to have to give him everything you got. Most Christians, you know, want God to help when... Uh, you know, either when they're sick and dying or if they're uh, in trouble with their marriage or, you know what I mean? People pray when they're in trouble, but, but don't praise and worship when they're not. And true Christians are in love with God and they worship him in the easy good times and they worship him in the hard times. Amen. Now, in order for you to give God total control of your life, you're obviously going to have to learn to trust him more than you trust yourself. 
I got one amen and two that's right. Anybody else want to vote on that one? It's very important that you get involved with me today or we're wasting our time. The last thing you need is for some, another, how many of you have heard at least a thousand sermons? Oh, I've heard a good 10,000. I don't want to waste any more time hearing some boring sermon where somebody says some nice stuff about God that has no power in it. Unless we hook up our faith right now, I need you to believe God with me. I need your help. One can put a thousand to fight, two can put 10,000 to fight. I need you to get your faith out there that we're going to get some revelation from the Holy Spirit. There's a place in the, in the book of in, uh, Ephesians where Paul was praying for Timothy. He said, Father, I pray that you would grant us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the intimate knowledge of God. There is a spirit of wisdom. It's not just a thing, wisdom. The Holy Spirit, when he comes into you and the spirit of Christ, he brings with him the wisdom of God and the mind of Christ. If you'll train yourself to pay attention, you'll have the wisdom of God and the mind of Christ. Now, here's what you have to do. You have to make up your mind, I'm not going to use my little pea brain to make all my decisions for the rest of my life. You know, scientists tell us that we use 8 or 9% of our gray matter. But God Almighty who created the universe and knows everything, including what the Dow Jones is going to do next week. Mm -hmm. I mean, he knows how to make you rich quick. But in order to follow God the way he wants us to, here's what he said. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God, not those who are led by their minds. Right. Now, we've grown up thinking, I've got to figure everything out, and then I'll make good decisions. That's not what God said. He said it's with the heart that man believes, not the brain. You intellectually consider it with your mind. But when you make the decision, you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth. Amen? Now, the Holy Spirit who has come to live in you when you got born again is in constant communication with your spirit. It's not your brain that got born again. It's your spirit. Your spirit's going to live forever with God who is spirit. And according to his word, you'll get a new body. Isn't that good news? Yes. When we get to heaven, we'll get a new body. Praise God. And uh, by the way, I'll still have long hair. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I may even get to wear Levi's in heaven. I don't know about that, but I'm. Uh... <clears throat> but we'll get a new body, but we still have the same spirit. When you get born again, all things become brand new. All the old has passed away. According to the word of God, you become a new creature. But it's your spirit that gets born again. It's not your brain. Your mind, according to Romans 12, 2, has to be renewed. Be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you want to be, you get born again, and your spirit is all of a sudden, you, you confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So your spirit, man, is totally cleansed from unrighteousness. And by the way, if you have no unrighteousness, what does that make you? The righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He that knew no sin became sin so that you and I could be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Well, that miracle has taken place for everybody in this room that's born again. And yet most Christians don't have a whole lot of what God's trying to give us. Well, let's just be honest. God Almighty is the great physician. He's not practicing medicine, y'all. He's got it down. Cancer does not scare him at all. AIDS doesn't bother him. He can get rid of AIDS as easy as he can get rid of a headache. Amen. I've had people tell, I had somebody tell me the other day, well, Brother Lefebvre, you're always talking about how God could just fix everything. The guy said to me, you don't understand what shape my life is in. You don't know what I've done, and therefore you don't know. He said, it's too late for me. And the Lord immediately told me, tell him I raised the dead. And I got to think about that. You know, when you're dead, that's pretty late. <laughs> to my way of thinking. But to God, that's not too late. That's right. Let me tell you something. God Almighty can fix more before you can get home for lunch than you and all the king's horses and all the king's men can fix in the next hundred years. But in order to get from here to there, you got to give him the rest of you. 
Now, whatever you've had a hard time letting go of, for some people, it's their money because they think money's important. For some people, it's their pride. You know, I mean, it's, uh, for some it's lust, for some it's greed, for some it's anger. I mean, it doesn't matter what it is. It's different for all of us. But if it's in God's way, if you don't, I, I was, uh, here's how I found this out. I, I had to have an operation. I went in a gym. I was trying to get in shape. I've lost about 25 pounds since, since last year, but I need to lose some more. And I went in a gym. I hired this guy, man. And I was, he was, he was, you know, he'd been pumping iron all his life. He was about 35 years old. I'm 61 years old. The guy was on the bench press. He was pumping his, he's throwing his lid around like it didn't weigh nothing. I was watching him do it. I was thinking, hmm, I'll do that. I think I'll get me some of that. I told the guy, move over. Let a man have some iron. <laughs> See, those are famous last Redneck last words. Let, let me, y'all know what last redneck words are, don't you? Hey, y'all, watch this. That's the last thing a redneck says right before he dies. Anyway, I grabbed me some iron. I busted a gut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all understand in Missouri, we ain't got all the rednecks in Texas, do we? Uh. So, you know, I busted a gut and I had to have an operation to fix it. And so I had to come off the road for three months. Doctor told me, you've never healed properly. We've done this same operation before. And uh, he said, you know, in order for you to heal, you need, you need three months off the road. Well, I'm 61 years old and I've been on the road since I was 15. And I don't mean going out every once in a while. I mean, I started a band when I was 15 years old. And every summer I was on the road the whole summer. My parents were gospel singers when I was a kid. My mom was 88 years old and she's out with Bill Gaither every weekend. Do you know how weird it is to have a mama almost 90 out doing a gig today? <laughs> my son-in-law has a band called the Newsboys. He and his, my daughter are all over the world. My mama's all over the world. Me and her, our family are like a bunch of gypsies. If we didn't have cell phones, we never would get to talk to each other. I don't, I don't have any idea where they are. My son-in-law just got back from Israel. I think my mama is home taking a day off today going to her own church. I think, but I'm not sure of that. But, uh, you know, I get to talk to her every day. But, you know, we, how do we get from here? The Bible plainly states, here's what God said. He's not withholding any good and perfect gift. God said, every gift that I have, I want to give it to you. I'm not withholding anything. It also says this. He's no respecter of person. God don't like Billy Graham anymore than he likes you. In fact, the Bible says this. This is hard to comprehend, but this is the truth because God said it. God loves me and you as, as much as he loves Jesus. That's what it says. Isn't that amazing? Now, you know, the first time I read that, I was thinking, no, nah, y'all, come on. God knows what I've done. That's right. And that's real love. When while we were yet sinners, he didn't wait till we got saved to die for us. While we were just in rebellion to everything holy, being proud and selfish and ignorant and, and, uh, and proud of it, Jesus died for our sins. Now, God wants to go home with you. I'm telling you, he wants to live at your house. He doesn't want to just hang around and observe. He wants to lead you every day. How many of you know that God is not a loser? Amen. That if God Almighty was leading us every day, we'd be winning big. I mean, uh, when it comes to healing, we could have it anytime we want to because it's the free gift of God. How many of you believe God's the healer? When it comes to prosperity, God ain't broke. Where he is, the streets are made out of pure gold. You know what I mean? If we were allowing him to be in control, we wouldn't be broke either. I ought to have got at least one amen on that. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I needed that. Now, here is the underlying truth, I think, that the Lord told me. In order for somebody to really, truly give up everything and follow him, here's the way he put it to me. He said, you'll never obey me when obedience requires you to defy, defy logic unless you believe that I love you more than you love yourself. 
unless you believe that God is love. I mean, does anybody in here truly, just think of somebody, you really, really, really love them. Well, God loves you a whole lot more than that because his love is unconditional. His love does not remember. The Bible says, here's what happened. When he forgave me and let me start my life over, I was, a, I was a drug addict, and, you know, I'd spent a lot of years. I was an adulterer. I had been out in rock and roll. Elvis cut one of my tunes. I spent about 15, well, almost 20 years stoned and just, just living like the devil. And, you know, all my heroes, I found out the, the Beatles, the Stones, Elvis, all the people that I thought were cool, they were into herbs and spices. <laughs> Some of y'all are telling on yourself now. I, some of y'all didn't want everybody to know y'all knew what herbs and spices were. And uh, so, of course, I got into them, too, and about killed me. And, uh, you know, I had to start my life over. I went to a second chapter of Acts concert in 1980. I was 35 years old. And if you've ever read the second chapter of Acts, what happened in the second chapter of Acts happened in me that night. I got born again. I got filled with the Holy Spirit of the living God. And, boy, that'll turn your head around. I guarantee you. Now, you know, you'll have to deal with, if you get filled with the Holy Spirit and when you have the evidence of as speaking and praying in a heavenly language, a couple of things will happen. First of all, lots of people will decide that you are a total fool because now you speak in a language that you don't even know what you're saying. <laughs> Second of all, you'll consider it yourself. And you'll either, amen. I have known people. I prayed with a guy in my own band one time, a good Baptist, a good boy who's on his way to heaven, a good man who received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the endowment with power that went with it and prayed in a heavenly language. And man, spiritual gifts started functioning in that man's life. And he went home at the end of that tour where God did that amazing thing and told his wife what God had done for him. And she rebuked him, told him he was crazy, that they didn't believe that stuff. And he stopped using that gift and he lost that gift because he couldn't take the heat in the kitchen. And so he walked out on God rather than be man enough to face her and say, you know what, not only is this real, but honey, I love you and you need this too. Now, and what am I talking about? I'm talking about it, the power of God. If you're going to enjoy God's best, then just having a, an intellectual relationship with God where you give assent, okay, maybe there is a God, something had to create all this stuff. And maybe Jesus is his son. That's different than having no doubt that God loves you, that by his stripes you were healed. Let me tell you something. You'll never defy logic unless you truly believe and have no doubt. If the doctor tells you you got cancer and you got six months to live, you better go home and get your house in order. You'll do one of two things. You'll be impressed with that $10 million worth of machinery that he used to come to that conclusion. You'll be impressed with that 35 years of education that he had that he can scare you in big, long Latin words that you can't even spell. And by the way, in case there's any doctors here, I'm not against doctors. Thank God for doctors. We need the wisdom of God. And of course, believing Christian doctors are, are a part of the solution, not the problem. And I'm just saying, anybody that disagrees with God is wrong. Is that the truth? Yeah. So if somebody says you're going to die, if you truly believe that by his stripes you were healed, you'll look that doctor in the eye and say to him, you know what? That thing that you just found in my body, why well, that kill an unsaved person? <laughs> but I'm not an unsaved person. So even though I don't deny the facts that you found that in my body, I do deny it's right to exist in my body. So I will resist the devil who's trying to kill me and he'll have to take his cancer and he'll have to get out of my, that stuff will have to die and get out of my body. So you just take all your little pictures and your little cat scans and everything because I want you to document this miracle as it's being happened, as it's happening. Now, you, that's defying logic. It's like tithing. You'll never tithe unless you believe God's honest. 
Unless you believe he loves you more than you love yourself, you'll never give him that 10% because your brain says, my God, I can't make my bills right now on 100% of my income. And now you're telling me I'm supposed to do better on 90? That don't make sense. Well, it doesn't make sense. It's just the truth. Amen. How's he going to do that? I don't know. I ain't God. I'm mine. But I know he did it in my house. He did it in my house. I remember when I was holding on to that little measly 10%. And those are some rough days. And I remember when I started trusting God. Well, he don't need my money and he don't need your money. He can create all the money he wants to. Do you know, you know, God Almighty, the Bible says that he changes the king's mind like a farmer changes an irrigation ditch. You know what I mean? He, he's got water going in the north 40. He turns the valve and it's going in the south 40. God takes people that you think are in control. Do you realize he could wake up Bill Gates this morning and tell him to pay off all our houses and Bill wouldn't even know when he's doing it, but he'd be writing the checks. That ain't a bad idea. Let's talk to God about that. <laughs> no, but that's what the favor of God is. Your boss is fussing at you on Friday, and all of a sudden you come in on Monday, and he's thinking, you're the best employee I've ever had. I need to give you a raise and make, put you in charge of this department. Amen. That's what the favor of God does. But most people think, well, you know, that'd be nice. Well, then it won't happen for you. Unless you have no doubt. Well, God loves me. Now, let me tell you what happens when you find out that God loves you. You quit trying to talk him into doing stuff. <laughs> oh, Jesus, please, God, oh, help me, Jesus. You realize he loves me. When you love somebody, they don't have to beg you. I have a daughter. She don't have to beg me and con me and manipulate me. I love to do stuff for her. I'm looking for stuff to do for her. I'm in love with Miss Christy. She can get anything she wants if I've got it. And if I ain't got it, I'll start working on it. That's what love does. Now, God loves me, and I don't have to beg him to do good stuff for me. He's going to do stuff for me even if I'm a dummy. I've found out. <laughs> even if I do too stupid stuff, He'll be merciful on, but, and, and still do good stuff for me. Now, if I'm wise, it'll be better. But if I mess up and stick my foot in my mouth, has anybody had their foot in their mouth this month? I'm not the only one. One of my heroes in the Bible was Peter. You ever read the life story of Peter? The only time that boy took his foot out of his mouth was to change feet. He said some of the dumbest stuff, and yet ended up being a hero in the faith. He grew up. Amen? I don't know about you, but I want to grow up. Now, I'm about out of time, so in the next service, I'll deal with what God sent me here. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I don't do... I don't do quick well. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I was in a church in Michigan recently, and they gave me 25 minutes. And, uh, and I told him, I said, brother, I grew up in Georgia. It takes us 25 minutes to say howdy. <laughs> you know, just to get in the room and get the... Well, I, I don't want to get us in a mess, but let me say this. God is love. Say it with me. God is love. Now say this with me in case there's any religious uh, spirits hanging around. This will always get rid of them. Love is God. Love is God. Now, the word selah means pause and think about that. I want you to pause and think about this. God is love. And when you understand that love is who and what God is. Some people say, well, you know, I, I loved her until that happened and, and then we, we, our, our love grew cold. That's a lie. Amen. You don't fall in and out of God. Amen. God is love. Feelings, those are nice things sometimes and they're bad things sometimes, but they're not God. 
God, what is love then? Well, first of all, Jesus is his name, but what love is, is this. It's a commitment. Here's what love said to me and you. I will never leave you or forsake you. In other words, if you mess up, I'm not looking for some excuse to divorce you, throw you away and go start over. Jesus said, I'll stick closer to you than a brother. I'll go with you even unto the ends of the earth. If you go to the highest mountain, I'll be there. You go to the bottom of the ocean, I'll be waiting on you. God said, I'm never leaving you. I am totally committed. I'm entering covenant with you. Even if you're unfaithful, how many of you know every one of us, not just before we got saved, is there anybody other than me will admit that you sinned since you got saved? We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. He's perfect and we're not. He didn't, he didn't ask us or command us to be perfect. He just commanded us to believe he is. Now, when he says, I love you, he wants us to relax in that. He ain't trying to get us. He's not, he, if he wanted to get us, we'd done unbent got. <laughs> Amen? Amen? He's trying to fix everything in our lives, and he wants to give us his healing. He wants to give us his wisdom. He wants to give us words of knowledge, words of wisdom, uh, prophetic utterances. He wants us to be able to understand the future, discerning of spirits. I mean, literally, there is no gift that God has that he's not given us. And here's what he said. If you'll trust me and submit to my Holy Spirit, it says this in the fifth chapter of the book of Galatians, then here's the fruit that will be produced in your life. The first one is always love. And if you'll walk in love and live by faith, you'll also receive the joy of the Lord. That joy will be produced and peace. You'll enjoy being God's child and the prince of peace will reign in you. And when everybody else is freaking out over the oil or the economy or whether the, um, you know, social security is going to be any good in 10 years. And I mean, there's, do you know how many things there are to worry about if you like to worry? Do you know how much there is to fear? Did you know that the most prescribed drug on the planet earth is antidepressants? Because people have so much fear. They worry about, oh my God, what's Osama going to do next? Who cares? He ain't going to do it to me. He's going to do it to people who choose the curse and don't have the protection of God in their life. He ain't going to do it to me and you not if you trust God. He's given his angels charge over me and you. Psalm 91 says, only a spectator shall I be. I'll see the stuff happening on CNN, but it won't happen in my house. It will not come nigh my tent. He has given his angels charge over me. They accompany me everywhere I go. They defend me. They protect me. That's the truth. Amen. Now, if you believe the truth, the truth will set you free. But I want to remind you of something. How do you get to where you don't have any doubts about the truth? Well, faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. And hearing some of you people who were here last night, you're getting your faith built right now. You got it built last night, but you're getting more faith right now. And hearing and hearing. How much faith do you want? Do you want just enough faith to get saved and then the devil beat you up till you get to heaven? Or would you like enough faith to where you can move mountains? Because that requires more word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But now listen to me. Faith comes by hearing, but it's released by speaking. If you've ever taken notes in church, you might want to write that one down. Because there's a lot of people got a whole lot of faith, but nothing that ever happens for them amazing because they won't speak it out. Oh, well, what if it doesn't work? What if it doesn't happen that way? Then everybody will think I'm a fool. I don't mean to bust your bubble, but lots of people already think that. <laughs> You're not a fool. You're born again. You've done the wisest thing there is on the earth to do if you're born again. You got the wisdom of God and the mind of Christ. You're not a fool, but there are people who still think so because you don't agree with them. Which is one of the wisest things you ever did, stop agreeing with them. Amen? Amen. Now, 
What are we talking about? We're talking about getting to that place where the power of God flows freely in your life. The alternative to that is religion. Just have a, a, a relationship with your denomination. Do you all remember this guy? Well, the perfect example. Do you remember this guy in Kansas City, the BTK killer? The guy was the president of his church. It was on the church's computer where he is antagonizing the police and making fun of them because he's killed so many people they don't know about. I'd say that boy had religion. What? Exactly. With, with no power of God, just a form of godliness that has no power. The ultimate religion. It's bad enough to be a sinner, but to do it in the name of Jesus, oh, Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm going with God, when I was a sinner, I was an excellent sinner. I worked at it every day. Practice makes perfect. I was a perfect sinner. If I'm going to live for Jesus, I don't want to mess around and putz around in the kingdom of God with the devil beating me up every day. Well, praise the Lord. Well, glory to God. <laughs> No, I want to walk with him, and, and, and I want him to enjoy. I, I want him having, since he knows what I'm thinking in my heart, the meditation in my heart, he knows. I would really like to live in such a way where he's constantly honored, wouldn't you? People, that's where the power of love comes in. Now, I, I've got to sit down in just a few minutes, but let me say this. Love, how many of you believe God has all the power? We know that. If, if the devil's trying to attack your family or, uh, get, you know, get you in trouble at work or, or steal your health or steal your peace or something like that, you know God can fix it if he wants to. You know love. You need to get used to saying that. God is love. Love can fix it if he wants to. Now, here's the key to how much God you have in your life. How much love do you have in your life? Now, the Bible says that the world will know that we belong to Christ by our love for each other, not by our love of God. Even though we should love God, Jesus has commanded us, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. This is the first and greatest commandment, Jesus said. Well, every Christian loves the Lord. I mean, come on, that's the easiest thing there is to do. He's never lied to me or about me. He's never hustled me. He doesn't abuse me. He's been nothing but good. I was the sinner, and he forgave me, cleansed me from all unrighteousness, cast my sins into a sea of forgiveness. By the way, he's never brought it up again. Amen. Now, I can't say that about everybody else. Everybody else brought it up when they got mad. But God didn't. After years of me uh, telling him I was going to be good if he'd get me out of trouble, he knew I wasn't. But when I finally got to the end of my rope and I was dying, and I didn't have anybody else to turn to because I was a heroin addict and a cocaine addict. And heroin addicts are liars, and everybody gets tired of them. You get tired of yourself. Anybody, you live in sin long enough, the wages of sin is death. When you start dying, it ain't pretty. Your hopes and dreams are dying. Your relationships are dying. I'll just tell you, when I gave my life to Jesus, he was the only one that wanted it. <laughs> Me and everybody else were sick of it. I was considering pulling the trigger, and everybody else was going, yeah, go for it, dude. <laughs> but God Almighty said, give it to me, son. I'm the one that makes roses grow out of manure. <laughs> I can take that mess you've created, but I don't want just your problems. Not if you want to walk in my power. I want you laugh. Amen. I want your relationships. Amen. Your money. I want your hopes and dreams. I want to live in you. I want you to live in me. And I want my word to so live in you. That you grow up to the point when this is what the Bible says. 
where you can ask anything you want and the Father will do it for you. Now, let me tell you something. When Christians grow up to that point to where every prayer we pray gets answered, do you know how long it'll take for everybody else to get saved? About a week for all the heathens to get jealous. All the Muslims be wanting what you got if it was obvious you had it. All the Buddhists and the Hindus would be saying, you know what, I don't think I'm going to burn any more incense to this little dummy. I think I'll go for the real God. Amen? But then we ought to be the most peaceful, loving, kind. Living by faith is what God told us to do. The just... Everybody who's been justified by your faith in the Son of God, according to him, no, you need to live by faith. That means you defy logic quite often. That means you look what the world thinks in the eye. And by the way, the more that you do it, the more they'll persecute you. And persecution doesn't come from people you don't like because when they say stuff, it don't bother you at all. That's not persecution. The persecution that really hurts is when your own family does it. Your in-laws and your outlaws are buzzing around, well, he's just become a religious fanatic. Okay, guilty as charged. I'm a religious fanatic. I'm in love with Jesus, and I am wanting to please him, and I ain't trying to please man. I want to, you can't be a God pleaser and a man pleaser. It's one or the other, God said. And if you please God, man ought to be pleased, but I found out they're not. It's Okay. Now, the key to walking in the power of God, since love has all the power, here's what he's saying. I'll give you the power, but I require one thing, that you love me. That's the easy part. Here's the hard part. And now you love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now, come on. Will anybody admit that's not easy? We ain't got all the rascals in Texas. I know this ain't heaven. This is Missouri. Y'all got some rascals in Missouri. And some of the worst rascals got the same last name as me and you. (laughs) Of whom some of us used to be the head rascals in our family. Come on. Right? Now, we've gotten saved. Now, are we going to love those that God loved us when we were rascals enough to die for us? Are we willing to love those others until they come in the kingdom knowing that they may choose not to? What would we do? You mean they've been lying to us, they've been lying about, there isn't anybody in here hadn't been lied to. There isn't anybody in here hadn't been lied about. And the amazing thing is the liars who lie to you and about you then go tell everybody else that you were the liar. And so if you're a Christian and you're a mature Christian, then you've been forgiven them. 77 times seven a day. This has been going on for so many years Be honest, there are days when you think, my forgiver's getting tired. (laughs) Has anybody in here other than me considered slapping one of them? Uh, And you have to remind yourself, no, no, that's not the way Jesus did it. No, no. But you just think to yourself, You know, they're claiming, uh, it's amazing how unsaved people tell Christians how to be Christians. Well, if you were really a Christian, you'd do what I think you ought to do. And you tell them, well, you know, that's not what the Bible says. Of course, they don't read the Bible, so they'll tell you, oh, yes, it does. And and they'll tell you what Uncle Louis said. (laughs) You know, but the bottom line is, Jesus didn't say, don't shoot until you see the whites of their eyes. Or a penny saved is a penny earned. I mean, he gets the blame for lots of stuff. Now, if you and I are going to go all the way with God, we got to love people that are hard to love. He's commanded us to do it. I found out that I wasn't doing it. I don't have time to tell you how that revelation came. But I will tell you this. When the Lord reminded me that I wasn't doing it. And by the way, I didn't know you could. I wasn't even trying. I I love people. Pastor Larry's been good to me. He believes in my ministry. I believe in his. He's always been honest to me. He's a giver. He practices what he preaches. He cares about me. When I was in the hospital, you know, he was praying for me. He's concerned about my life. He and Loretta care about me and Christy. His integrity makes him easy to love. 
But now what about some other people who could give a hoot? And Jesus loves all of us the same, and he wants us to love everybody the same. He even said this, love your enemies. Now, I'm going to have to go into that part in the second service. So if you want to learn, I mean, this is the key. Let me tell you something. This is the key to how much power God can trust me and you with. The love walk, why is it so important? Because I don't care if you memorize the whole Bible. Faith works by love. If you have mountain moving faith, it won't work if you don't love people. And Jesus said it this way. He said, if you say that you love God and yet you don't love people, he said, you can't love God because you can't love somebody you haven't seen if you don't love the people you have seen. He said it's impossible. So can it be done? Yes, it can be done. God's not a joker or a clown. He wouldn't tell you to do something and not give you the grace to do it. So I had to repent. I had to take responsibility. He told me, he said, son, you don't love people that are hard to love. And of course, that was true. When God tells you something, he'd seen my heart. He knew. I had just, I had just written some people off. I had spiritually assassinated some folks. They had lied to me so many times, and they had just, uh, you know, I, I threw my pearls before them. The most valuable thing on the earth to me is my ministry. I prayed for them. I gave the anointing to them. I gave until I didn't have any more to give, and they laughed at it and made fun of it. And so I, I just basically said, you know what? You're out of here. And I quit loving them. And God told me, that's unacceptable, son. And and. And I can't trust you with more of my anointing. And that's what you're always talking to me about. You want to see blind eyes open, and You want to see people jumping out of wheelchairs. You want to see cancer dying. You want to see the dead being raised. Yes, I do, sir. Yes, I do. Those are things that God does, and I'd love to be a part of that. I know I don't have the power to do anything like that, but the one that lives in me does. And you don't have to talk him into doing that kind of stuff. That's what he did when he was here on earth, and he ain't changed at all. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He loves to go around healing all who are oppressed of the devil. And you don't have to talk him into it. He's just good. Amen? So he told me, he said, son, if you're going to get involved in that, you're going to have to love the people that are hard to love. So the first thing that I had to do was repent for not doing it. How many of you know when Jesus tells you to love your neighbor as you love yourself, you don't get to choose your neighbor? Come on now. You look over there one day, you look out the window, and they're unloading the truck. They could be real sweet people. They might be Adolf Hitler's family. But we're supposed to love them no matter what. I said, God, I don't know how to do that. He said, son, it's real simple. You do it like everything else in my kingdom, you do it by faith. I said, okay. He said, first thing you do is you take responsibility for not doing it. I told you to do it and you didn't do it. You know what that is? It's sin. Sin is not just, I mean, the things that I used to do. Everybody loves to hear my testimony. What a rat I was. Yeah, I ran around with groupies and I took drugs and I did this and that and the other and got drunk. All that juicy stuff. Everybody loves that. Well, I didn't go back to running around with women, and I didn't go back to doing drugs, and I hadn't robbed any banks or shot anybody. I just disobeyed God. He told me to love everybody, and I didn't do it. And that's sin. And, you know, he, he just showed me one day. He said, you know, you've seen your ministry. It, it's wonderful to have led hundreds of thousands of people to Christ. That little Christian band I was in, we led 211,000 people to Christ before 1993. I mean, that's just magnificent to be a part of, of ushering people into the kingdom of God and into his presence. That's, that's magnificent. The Lord reminded me, what could you have done if you hadn't been living in sin? Now, the good thing is, since I didn't know it at the time, God's merciful. That's what his mercy and his grace is for. I didn't know that I was in disobedience. I thought I was doing good. But now that he decided, well, okay, you're mature enough to understand this, now I'm going to show you something else you need to change. How many of you know as long as you're alive on this planet, God's going to be helping us to grow up? We're going to be changing daily into the image of the Son of God as long as we live by faith and walk in love. Amen. 
So before we leave today, I've got to stop. But again, if you have time to hang in the second service, we'll go into a whole nother section of this. But uh, if you're here today and you've made that same mistake, remember, it's nothing to be ashamed of. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wise, the wise people will humble themselves and admit it. Because if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. If we don't confess them, we don't get forgiven. So before we leave here today, I want to join my faith with yours. Is there anybody that would say, you know what? I have got some people that have hurt me so bad, and, and I'm constantly reminded I've been working on forgiving them, and I pray for those. I bless those who curse me. I pray for those who spitefully use me. But I know in my heart there's some people I haven't really been loving, and I'm willing to do that by the grace of God. But I judge myself. And I think disobedience is sin, and I hadn't been doing it. Is there anybody that would say, join your faith with mine, that I'll be able to do this in the future? Glory to God. Glory to God in the highest. Now, what happens when we take repentance means we stop blaming our problems on the devil and our mother-in-law. And we say, you know what? I did that, God. And we take responsibility and we're willing to change. That's what true repentance is. Is there anybody else? You've been thinking this through and you want to get this in. Praise God, honey. I, I respect you for that. Anybody else willing to say, you know what? I've made that mistake. Or maybe it's another one. It's not anybody's business. You don't have to confess your sins to me. You just have to confess them to God. Anybody else? You judge yourself of any kind of sin. We want to get rid of it before you leave this room. Sin will kill you. Wages of sin is death. Praise God. Praise God. Anybody else? Praise God. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Excellent decision. Pray this prayer with me, please, everybody. Father God, I come to you this morning in the name of Jesus because I believe that he is your son. Now, Father, I take responsibility for my sins. God, I ask you to forgive me for ignoring you, for going my own way, doing what my flesh wanted to do instead of what you commanded me to do. And I judge myself. And that was wrong, Lord. I humble myself today and I submit to you, God, and to your word, which is your will. From this day forward, I'm going to read your word. I'm going to think about what it says. And by the grace of God, I'm going to live your word. I'm going to let your word live in me. I want to be led by your spirit. And I trust you, Father. So I invite you. Fill me up, Lord. Fill me with yourself. To overflowing. Fill me with love. And I'll give you all the glory and the honor. Thank you for cleansing me. Thank you for making me holy. I love you, Lord, with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength. And I will love my neighbor, whether it's easy or hard. I will love my neighbor as I love myself. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as pastor comes, pastor, sir, if you'll come. Uh, please don't move if you don't have to. Let me tell you this one last thing. There are a few things that you need to know about that are practical about how to do that. And to tell you the truth, I couldn't go any faster than I just went. But there's a few things that are not required in love, and there's a few things that are. And if you have time, if you can, get you a cup of coffee and wash your face or something, come back to the next service. Because I believe if you don't understand how to do this, you won't be able to. I've been studying it. He told me this in January. I've been studying this now for these nine months. And I'm learning how to do this, and it's raised the quality of my life. And by the way, 
One of the things I always wanted to see, I asked the Lord, I said, God, I want to see blind eyes opening. Since I got this straight with God, I laid hands on a kid in, in, uh, in New Jersey recently that got his sight, was blind, and now he sees. God wants to do stuff in your life that is just, whoa. I mean, that you just go, is God really doing that at my house? Yeah, he wants to do such supernatural, wonderful, what, what I call doctor shockers. He wants to do it in your finances. And love is the key. So if you can, come to the next service because I sure would like to give you just a little bit more information. Thank you, Pastor.